So good morning, Southside Bible Church. And uh, I see that Douglas County has its fall break, and, and that's good. I hope people are enjoying their time and their families together. Um, I'm uh, Pastor Nate Thompson. I'm uh, going to be one of the men uh, standing in for Ken as he's uh, spending some time away with his family. And uh, I want to welcome any guests that we might have with us. And as Pastor Greg um, welcomed you, uh, just to remind you in the foyer is our Welcome Center. So we'd love to say hi to you if you are new to Southside. So will you pray with me as we start this morning? So God, I pray that you would be with us now. As we open your word, would you speak your truth? Would you use me? Would you open the eyes and ears of your people to see and hear you? That Christ might be exalted. In his name we pray. Amen. So John Crosby writes of a third grade teacher who asked her pupils to draw a picture of what they wanted to be when they grew up. The pictures came in, pictures of nurse, nurses, of space cadets, of firemen, but one little girl handed in a blank sheet. Don't you know what you want to be, asked the teacher. Sure I know, retorted the little girl. I want to be married, but I don't know how to draw it. And that little girl is right. It's a very difficult picture to draw, but it's a picture that we are going to see this morning in God's Word. So if you would, open your Bibles. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 22 to 33. So this past Friday and Saturday here at Southside, we've been doing a marriage uh, retreat, and you've been looking at couples throughout the Scripture um, they had an opportunity to look at the failure of Adam and Eve in marriage, the faithlessness of Abraham and Sarai in attempting to get a son via their own means, an Ishmael, the faithfulness of Aquila and Priscilla in their New Testament ministry. And then this morning, we we're capping off that retreat with the the uh, fulfillment of marriage found in Christ's relationship to the church. So there's a backdrop to this whole section that we're going to look at. And the book of Ephesians, as some of you might know, is kind of divided right down the middle. There's the first three chapters that's full of what are called indicatives, which indicate something. And they are indicative of who we are and what we have in Christ Jesus. And so we're front-loaded with all these indicatives, and then the back half of the, the uh, book, the last three chapters, is chocked full of imperatives, which are commands. Do this, do this, do this, act this way, behave this way, obey this way. So first we get our imperatives, then we get into a, an indicatives. So seeing as this is in the back half of the book, guess what? It's chocked full of imperatives. So before we step into this passage, we're going to take a different take on it too. Um, I want to front load us with the imperatives and remind us what the book has already said. So in chapter 1, verse 3, in Christ we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, in Christ and according to his wisdom and love, our sins have been forgiven. In chapter 1, verses 11 through 14, in Christ, we have an inheritance that includes the seal of the Holy Spirit now in all who are believers in Christ Jesus. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, in Christ, though we did not deserve His mercy, God showed His mercy to us by bringing us from death to life and seating us with Himself in the heavenly places. Chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. In Christ, we have been brought near when we were outsiders and brought about a lasting peace in Himself. Chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. In Christ, we have been granted access to God and can approach Him as, as we go through our various trials. Chapter 3, 
verses 14 through 19, in Christ, we can now know the love of God that is in himself. Chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, finally, in Christ, what God can do in us and through us and what he has for us is beyond whatever we could ever think or ask. That is a huge front load of indicatives. And then in chapter 4, uh, verse 1, we step into it, therefore, that front loads all of those verses. So we find ourselves in chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. And here's the thing. I know a lot of you have heard this section of Scripture before. Um, you might be single. You might be a youth. You might be in a difficult marriage. You might just be down on yourself, and the last thing you want to hear is to, for me to tell you, to a, to a woman, how terrible a wife you're being, or for you as a guy, how terrible a husband you're being. So I get it. So we're going to do something different with the passage, because the focal point that we're going to make is not so much about husbands and wives, but about the husband and the wife that this whole passage is about. And what I found was that most commentators kind of ran out of gas by the time they hit 532, they had so emphasized husbands and wives that they hit this phrase with, this mystery is great, and they're like, yeah, it is, and it's Christ in the church, and, and I'm tired and want to go to bed. And so they'll just say, and it is, and it's great. But what I want us to do is lead with that thought. Because verse 32 says, this mystery is great. And he's saying, I'm not talking about marriage. I'm talking about Christ and the church. And so what we're going to do is, is it's, it's, it's like a soundboard. When I was uh, a teenager, I went to Nashville um, for a, it was a national swimming competition. I went with my dad and he, uh, in the midst of things, said, hey, why don't we go to this country music hall of fame thing? And I was, oh, okay. All right, sure. And we go. And one of the things that they had was a soundboard. And in this, on the soundboard, they had the ability to, <clears throat> to, to uh, either turn up or, or turn down any, any instrument in a piece of music. <clears throat> and one of the things that they did was they said, I want you to take one dial at a time and turn it up. And I want you to see if you can figure out what song this is. And and my dad was the one that was bold enough to go up, and he would turn one up, and you'd hear like a guitar. And then he'd turn it down, and then he'd tune something up, and it was a, it was a trumpet, and then a, then a violin. And then once you turned it all up, you got the full sound. You were like, oh, that's what the song is. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the soundboard, and we're going to turn down all the imperatives on, on husbands and wives. And what we're going to do is we're going to turn up all of the phrases that are focusing on Christ and the church. With the goal being, by the time that we hit verse 32, we're front-loaded with what this is targeting. So that we don't just, oh man, he has so weighted us down with what we should be doing as husbands and wives that we're going to just kind of bypass verse 32. And I kind of want to focus on verse 32. So, this is for everybody. Since we're talking about Christ in the church, if you are single, if you are young, this is about you. This is about you if you are in Christ. So, let's go ahead and read our passage. And what I want you to do is tune your ears to listen for Christ and the church. Okay? Let's open it up with verse 22. Wives. Be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should, uh, that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. 
He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So here's the outline that we're going to bring to this text. First point that we're going to make is Christ as the monarch of marriage. Okay, Christ as the monarch of marriage. Second, Christ as the motivation of marriage. Third, Christ as the means of marriage. And fourth, Christ as the meaning of marriage. So once, we're, once we close that up, we will make application. So just as we are tuning down these imperatives, we're going to tune them back up at the end. But we're going to have a lot of reason for tuning them up. So I get it. Some of you might be thinking, this isn't the outline in my MacArthur study Bible. That's all right. Let me assure you. I am an expert at not being John MacArthur. <laughs> and what qualifies me is that I am, in fact, not John MacArthur. But let me remind you, you are not Grace Community Church. <laughs> So we're even there. So we can each be disappointed or we can each learn. And so let's hope we grow together in this. So uh, now that we have that out of the way, let's go ahead and focus on our first point, Christ as the monarch of marriage. Christ as the monarch of marriage. So I, I, I hope you saw it in verse 20, 22, very end there, it says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. As to the Lord. The word is kurios. He doesn't use the word uh, theos, uh, God. He doesn't say as to God, but as to the Lord. And this uh, has, has meaning to it, right? Uh, the word uh, kurios means he to whom a person or thing belongs about which he has power of deciding, i.e. a master. So that means that this submission should reflect a submission that is the ultimate submission to Christ our Lord. He, he controls. He makes the decisions. And the second phrase that I want us to dial in on is, is in the next chapter, uh, in, in the next verse, second part of it, for the husband is the head of the wife, and then here it is, as Christ also is the head of the church. Think about this physiologically. The head, if, if there is no functioning head, how well does the body work? Not at all, right? If a person is brain dead, they are non-functional. They could have a very athletic, very healthy body, but without a head, it is useless. It's useless. And that's the way that the church is. And, and we're talking about the head of the church. We're not talking about the church leaders. We're not talking about the elders and the deacons. They're merely under shepherds and parts of the body. Do you hear me? They are a part of the body. Who's the head? Christ is the head. Christ is the head. Acts 4.11 uses this word for head, it's used in a different wording or a different interpretation in the NASB. It's, it's interpreted as chief here in this verse. It says, he, Christ, is the stone which was rejected by you, the Jews, the builders, but which became the chief, there it is, cornerstone. The chief cornerstone, the head. He's the head. So, in like manner, we, you could have a young lady who's actually single that can claim that she's married. She can put a ring on, on her finger. She can uh, speak of her spouse in an endearing way. She can de define, uh, she can make definite claims about her one true love. She can say all of these things, 
but in fact, she isn't married. What would make her married? Well, if she had a husband, right? The same goes for any modern-day church. They can make all claims that they want, but without Christ, there's no marriage. And they're not really a bride. They're not really a church. They need Christ. He's the head. Christ is the monarch of marriage. Now, you might not like that word, but it's an M, and I needed it to blend in with my other M's. So (laughs) it is what it is. So he is the monarch. He is the head. He is the Lord of marriage. And ultimately, the marriage. So let me move us on to our next point. Christ as the motivation of marriage, right? We're going to look at the second half of verse, or the back half of verse 23, all the way through verse 25. Verse 23, he himself being the savior of the body, let's lock in on that, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be subject to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So I want us to see three things. Christ as the Savior, Christ as the lover, and Christ as the sacrificer. Okay? I want us to see those three things. So first, Christ as the Savior of the church. You want to talk about ultimate motivation. This is it. Titus 3, 3 through 7. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I could probably just stop right there, and that would be enough. Christ is our Savior. The motivation for the ultimate marriage, His bride being us, His church. He saved us. And boy, did we need saving, as you heard the front part of that verse. We needed saving. And He saved us. And He went further than just getting rid of or dealing with our sin. He cleansed us. He regenerated us. He renewed us. He gave us of His Holy Spirit. What a Savior. Hallelujah. Second, as if that wasn't enough, He loved us. And I want you to see something. Um, it's, It's all too easy to draw an equal sign between love and sacrifice. It's an easy thing for us to do because the passage just kind of flows. And when we're particularly when we're talking about the imperatives for husbands, it makes it a little easier for us if we just say love equals sacrifice, and we can build into what sacrifice is and walk off. No. No, it says love and sacrifice. So I want us to see that it's a both and not an either or, or not saying the same thing twice. He's not saying sacrifice and sacrifice. He's saying love and sacrifice. Here's the thing. This same pattern is is used elsewhere in Scripture. 1 John 4, 10, and 11. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us, see it? And sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. I'm putting 11 in there to show that, it, that there's more to it than just the sacrifice. It's love and sacrifice. And uh, Galatians 2.20, those of you who are familiar with that passage, 
I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who, here it is, loved me and gave himself up for me. You see? Same thing. Love and sacrifice. So it's not to say sacrifice doesn't matter. It does because it's right there and it's huge. But it's also love. And we could go on for days talking about the love of God. And, and I won't do that to you. I, I know you've got things to do. I do too. But you could spend the entire day, the rest of the week, just dwelling on the love of God that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. So to show that there's other things other than just sacrifice with respect to God's love, in this book, Ephesians chapter 1, looking at verses 3 through 6, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, here it is, He predestined us as the adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. What, what does his love do? Well, yes, his love saves us, but also we're adopted children because of his love for us. He didn't need to do that, but he did. We're adopted in Christ. There's a similar thought in Ephesians 2, 4 through 7, talking about his great love seeding us with him in the heavenly places. So God's love accomplishes that too. And like I said, we could go on and on and on about God's love. So God's love as a motivation for the marriage that we have in Christ. We are His church, and He loves us. Look at this great love. He also, also, in the last part of verse 25, sacrifices for us, right? In that He gave Himself for us, the church. Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrated His love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Sacrifice. Without the sacrifice of Christ, let's, so let's not diminish this, there would be no church. There would be no bride. There would be no one, hear me, no one, able to dwell with him in eternity. No one, nobody, without the sacrifice of Christ. Yes, he loved us. Yes, he sacrificed for us. Oh, church, I hope we are motivated, motivated by this marriage, this marriage that's to our Lord, to our head. He is our Savior who loves us who sacrificed, who gave himself for us. Okay, so let's move on. Our next focal point about Christ and marriage is church. We'll look at verses 26 through 30 here. And this is Christ, uh, Christ as the means of marriage, as the means of marriage. Okay, so verse 26. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So the husband ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it just also does, Christ does the church. So I want us to see that connection. He makes a statement about nourishing and cherishing. But before that, he makes the statement about the church and her sanctification. He sanctifies her. How does he sanctify her? How does he set her apart as holy? How does he do this? We're not left to wonder. 
having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. This is a fulfillment of the high priestly prayer found in John 17, 17 through 19, where Christ prays, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes, this is, this is you and I, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. So we get a connection here. We get two pointers to truth. We get the Word of God, and we get Jesus Christ Himself. John 14, 6. I am the way and the... Thank you. The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's it. So His Word leads us to His Son. Don't worship the Word. Worship the Word. You tracking with me? Don't worship the book. Worship the Christ. Because the book points to the Christ. Points to Jesus. We are thankful for this book because it describes to us who God is so that when He came, took on flesh, the people that knew Him, knew Him. And as Hebrews tells us, He is the exact representation of His nature. Jesus Christ is God. To His praise and glory. Thank you, Jesus. He is the means. He is the means. His truth. And Jesus Christ Himself, He is the means. He also, to us the church, He nourishes and He cherishes us. So Matthew 6.26, which is a, it uses a Greek word that's derivative to the one that's used here in our passage for nourishes, makes it clear that what nourish means is to feed, and to feed what is needed, right? I, I can feed you and I can fill your belly full of Pringles potato chips, and you will not be nourished, but you will be full. Christ nourishes us, meaning he fills us with the very thing that we need, which is more of him, more of his word, more of his truth. When Christ was tempted in the wilderness, he told Satan in Matthew 4, 4, that man does not live by bread alone, but how? By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He loves his church. He nourishes his church. He gives his church the word of God. So he nourishes us in what we need. John 4, 34, Christ said that his food or his nourishment was to do what? The will of him who sent me. So God's word also points us in the direction of how we should live our lives in a way that honors God. I want to do the will of God. And God's not ambiguous about what that looks like. He's revealed himself. He's revealed his will through his word. God's a good God. He also cherishes us. This is a really sweet word. It's used in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.7. And it's <clears throat> used uh, to describe the tender cares of motherly affection. So I want you to think about your moms, um, those of you who were blessed with moms who were gentle and kind and stayed up with you those nights when you were sick. I had a mom who would, would do that and put up with my childishness just last year. No, not quite <laughs> that bad, but, but you get the point. Moms who tenderly care for us, our Christ, our God, our bridegroom, O church, 
He nourishes us, but he also cherishes us. And here's the thing. <laughs> Before he saved us, there was nothing cherishing about us. We were, we were ugly. And he's the one that made us beautiful. And he cherishes us. Because what he sees in us is him. Because that's what he has placed in us. He invested value. He put value into us. Oh, what a good, good bridegroom to this church. He so cherishes us. So let's move on to, to the next part of our outline. Christ as the meaning of marriage. Christ is the meaning of marriage. And that's going to get us to verse 32. So let's look at these last few verses. Verse 31 says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he says, This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. So he gave us an Old Testament quote and then he says, mystery. And before the person can say, what's so mysterious about marriage? He hits them and says, I'm not talking about marriage as you guys are thinking of right now. I'm talking about Christ and the church. So he took the first reference to marriage in the Bible. Galatians, uh, sorry, Genesis 2, 20. It's Genesis 2, 20. And it's that culmination. Remember, we have Adam. He's created from the dust of the earth. And it says, well, there wasn't, wasn't somebody suitable for him. And God makes all these animals, has the animals going past him to see what he would name them. And he's naming them. And what Adam is seeing is two, 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 getting a pattern. And then Christ says, I'm going to make somebody like you for you a helper suitable for you puts adam to sleep takes out from adam a rib fashions the woman brings the woman to adam and adam says that's cool This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Wow! She'll, she'll be called, wow, man! Um, <laughs> no, not quite, but she, she'll, she shall be called woman because she came out of man, Ish, Isha. Okay. And, then, and then we get Genesis 2.20. And Christ goes, and he, or, or Paul goes, Boom. I'm going to give you Genesis 2.20, I'm going to go boom. What's he doing? He's saying, Christ in the church? That was the point the whole time. That was his goal, that was his plan the whole time. Since the beginning, that was the plan. We didn't just have marriage, and then Christ comes and goes, God goes, hmm, hey, I can use that analogy. No, that's not the way God works. This was predetermined. Way before there was marriage. Ever think, you know, I don't know if you're like me, ever think, why was Adam made out of the dirt and Eve wasn't? I thought about that. I thought about it when I hit this passage and thought about this mystery. Look at this. This is cool stuff. Eve came from Adam. Likewise, the church came from Christ. There's a picture. There's an intentionality in the picture. This came out of this. Tracking with me? We came out of Christ. We came out of Christ. That's the church. Eve was presented to Adam. God brought the woman to the man. 
Why is that there in the text? Well, likewise, the church is presented to Christ, Ephesians 5, 27, Revelation 19, 7 through 8. You, you uh, heard that this morning from Greg. Adam and Eve are told that they are one flesh. We're made one with Christ, Romans 6, 5 through 7, John 14, 20, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. We are made one with Christ. Do you see the analogy? The point of his making marriage was to point to his original point, which was Christ in the church. His intention of Christ in the church was there, and that's why we have marriage. It was always about Christ. And one day, the marriage will be realized when Revelation 19, 20, and 21 are all realized. That's going to be the marriage. And Matthew 22, Christ makes it very clear. The marriage that we get to enjoy, and it is a blessing. I'm, I'm married to a wonderful, wonderful woman. My Kimberly for 26 years now. That goes away. And you might be a little sad. Like, I really like this. Well, I do too. It's great. Here's the thing. You don't need the picture when the reality has come. It makes sense? You and I have an opportunity to be the picture. To be the best picture possible unto the reality that will be realized, fulfilled in Christ and his church. And if you are in Christ, if you are single or married, young or old, you are a part of the bride. You are a part of the bride. So you have a role to play even if you aren't married. You tracking with me? You have a role to play even if you aren't married. So don't get bummed out like, this doesn't really apply to me. I'm single. It does apply to you because you're a part of the church. So Christ is the meaning of marriage. If you are married, the real meaning behind your marriage is Christ and the church. That's the real meaning meaning. And if you want a Christ-centered marriage, it needs to be focused on that. You need to build out from there. So let me bring us to a point of, points of application here. In verses 22 through 24 and verse 33, wives, if you're in Christ, if you're a believer, out of these roles in the picture of marriage, are, you are told to submit and to respect your husbands. Women, you have a chance, a small opportunity by faith to be a picture of the final marriage, that of Christ in the church. As Christ indicated in Matthew 22, marriage as we know it will cease in heaven. This is because the reality of the picture has been revealed. So I'm going to beg you, Submit and respect to your husbands, no matter how unworthy they might be. And this is not because we preach some demented, hyper-masculine system of oppression, but because we preach Christ and Him crucified. Is He not worthy of your picture? Now is your brief chance in this short life to be the picture of the redeemed church. Will you take up this challenge? Verses 25 through 29 and verse 33, husbands. If you're in Christ, out of these roles in the picture of marriage, you were told to love and to sacrifice, and to nourish, and to cherish your wives. Men, you have a chance. 
you a small opportunity by faith to be the picture of the real picture of marriage, that of Christ and the church. Don't cop out. Don't claim it's impossible and then walk off the stage. Men, if you're in Christ, he has made you a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. And the Spirit of God is resident in you, Romans 8, 9 through 11. And women, you are too. Yes, you can do this because of Christ in you. You can reflect this love because of the Christ who redeemed you. So, your sacrificing of your free time at your job does not complete the picture of love. So don't just get wired in on sacrifice and I sacrifice. You need to love her, you need to nourish her, and you need to cherish her. Men, I beg you to love your wives as Christ loved the church no matter how unlovely she might be. Not because we preach false humility and not because we preach cowardice, but because we preach Christ and Him crucified. Is He not worthy of your picture? Now is your brief chance in this short life to be the picture of our loving Lord and Savior. Will you take up the challenge? Singles, you are mentioned all throughout verses 22 to 33. If you're in Christ, you are members of the body of Christ. You have a chance to help promote the picture of the final marriage, that of Christ and the church. You are members of the body of Christ. And you have an obligation to help those who are married to promote this picture. Will you encourage them to stay in their marriages? Will you encourage them when the things are hard and they're hard pressed? Will you encourage them to display this picture of the gospel? Now is your chance to promote this picture of a lovely bride in the church. Will you encourage them to love their husband, the Lord Jesus Christ? And will you love your husband, the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you take up this challenge? Church, this is all of you. This is all of us. We have a brief opportunity to clothe ourselves in good works. Revelation 19.8, remember hearing it this morning, was read. The bride, the church, that's all of us, is clothed in fine linen, ready to be presented to the bridegroom. Jesus Christ, do you recall those fine garments? What are they made of? They are the righteous acts of the saints. So let's not forget Ephesians 2.10. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Our sovereign God who knows the ins and outs, the joys and the trials of our lives has called us into these good works. Church, let us clothe ourselves in a manner worthy of our bridegroom Jesus Christ. All of us are called to this. Do you want to clothe the bride? Does your heart beat to clothe her well? The wedding day is coming. Let us with one heart, one voice, desire to clothe her well. Because our bridegroom is glorious and beautiful and worthy. Is he not? Is he not? Will you take up this challenge? So I'll close with this. In 1979, Eric Fellman 
speaks of meeting a Chinese couple in Hong Kong while traveling to China. <clears throat> he says, a friend took me down a narrow alley to a second floor flat to meet a man recently released from prison in China. I knew I would be pressed to carry Bibles and literature on my trip, but I was hesitant and tried to mask my fear with rationalizations about legalities and other concerns. A Chinese man in his 60s opened the door. His smile was radiant, but his back was bent almost double. He led us to a sparsely furnished room. A Chinese woman of about the same age came to serve tea. As she lingered, I couldn't help but notice how they touched and lovingly looked at each other. My staring apparently didn't go unnoticed, for soon they were both giggling. What is it? I asked my friend. Oh, nothing, he said with a smile. They just want you to know it, it's okay. They're newlyweds. I learned they had been engaged in 1949. When he was a student at Nanking Seminary, on the day of their wedding rehearsal, Chinese communists seized the seminary. They took the students to a hard labor camp for the next 30 years. The bride-to-be was allowed only one visit per year. Each time, following their brief minutes together, the man would be called to the warden's office. You may go home with your bride, he said, if you will renounce Christianity. Year after year, this man replied with just one word. No. I was stunned. How had he been able to stand the strain for so long, being denied his family, his marriage, even his health? When I asked, he seemed to be astonished at my question. He replied, with, with all that Jesus has done for me, how could I betray him? The next day, <laughs> I requested that my suitcase be crammed with Bibles and training literature for, for Chinese Christians. I determined not to lie about the materials, yet lost not one minute of sleep worrying about the consequences. <clears throat> and as God had planned, my suitcase was never inspected. Is he worthy? Is he the sovereign? Does he control all things? And is he the sovereign of our marriages unto the marriage? Will you, with one heart, serve, serve the bride unto this glorious Savior? Pray with me. Oh, what a beautiful picture, Lord Jesus. Only you could paint such a masterful piece. Marriage is good because you have made it good. And Lord, I pray that we make your marriage a beautiful one. May we honor you with our lives, our words, our thoughts, our deeds. May we be a people about you. May the focal point of our marriage be Jesus Christ. May we submit to him. May he be our head. May you honor, may you be honored in us. Thank you, thank you, thank you for Jesus Christ, who is the reason, who is our motivation, who is our means, who is our everything. In whose name we pray.